Thank you for making it this, this far into the day with us. I know it was an intense morning and I, we appreciate your attendance and welcome to this session. One of the, uh, the, we heard all morning that innovation is good. So one of our innovations at the banking conference this year is to have these breakout sessions. Um, my name is Peter Greif. I'm just going to make a very short introductory uh, uh, presentation here, not even a presentation, but introduce Professor Goodwin. Um, we're, he's going to speak uh, uh, for 20, 30 minutes or maybe a little more, but then we hope to open it up to dialogue. I hope you'll ask some interesting, challenging questions so that I don't have to, but if you don't, I will. Um, uh, and thanks for, for being here. So, Professor Goodwin, you might have seen in the program, is uh, an academic, writer, and speaker. He's known for his work on political risk, populism, British politics, European politics, and elections. He's a professor of politics at the University of Kent and senior visiting fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. So he's the author of six books. We actually had uh, uh, his latest book. We had 25 copies over here. I'm glad to see you've, uh, you've taken them. It's come out in Spanish. It's come out in Portuguese. So you can, or about to come out in Portuguese. So uh, if you didn't get it here, uh, buy it on Amazon. Is a Sunday Times bestseller. <laughs> he also wrote Brexit, Why Britain Voted to Leave the European Union. And he's, given his theme, he's been quite a media uh, uh, figure in the UK lately. He actually advised funds on Brexit and called the referendum in 2016 the way it went. But then in the 2017 general election, he made another prediction that didn't quite come out. But he's a man of his word. And he showed it, he demonstrated it. I'm going to show you. Isaac Jeremy Corbyn added two percentage points uh, or got two percentage points more than I had expected. And I did say that I would uh, eat this book, which is available at all good uh, bookstores. Um, two percentage points makes a big difference. I am a man of my word. So what I'm going to do is just sit here and eat my book while you guys carry on. It's, it's actually a hardback, there are lots of chemicals, but I've got to get through the whole thing, so. I give you now a man of his word, Professor Matthew Goodwin. Well, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Peter, for destroying my credibility before I even begin this talk. Um, just to be clear, what I predicted at the last general election two years ago was that the Labour Party would not win that election, uh, and they, they lost that election. But I also predicted that they wouldn't reach 38% of the vote, that Jeremy Corbyn, the most radical left-wing politician that Britain has really had in the post-war period, uh, would not exceed 38% of the vote. And of course, he got 40%, so he exceeded it by two points. Um, and in a way, that actually matters for where we are today uh, with Jeremy Corbyn now going into our election in December, um, generating a lot of panic. A lot of your counterparts in London keep uh, asking me what's going to happen at the general election because this is somebody who is offering pretty radical reforms of the British economy, renationalization of rail, electricity, gas, excessive pay levy, income tax rates, 50, uh, 50 pence on the pound for people who earn over 123,000, corporation tax increases, removing tax exemptions for private schools, um, removing non-domiciled status, um, basically going after what Jeremy Corbyn calls the top 5%. Um, and so Corbyn uh, really does matter um, and as somebody in the City of London said to me a few weeks ago, there is a two-punch combination facing Britain. There is a messy Brexit followed by a Labour government. And I think that's an interesting uh, analogy for where we are at the moment. And to be blunt, I could talk all day about Brexit. But, uh, and if you want to talk about Brexit during the questions of the discussion, I'll talk a little bit about Brexit, but, but I'm not mainly going to talk about it. Um, I'm mainly going to be looking at, at the broader trends that are sweeping across many of our advanced democracies relating to the rise of populism uh, and relating to the rise of movements that I think are still, have still got a long way to run, 
um, not only here in uh, Spain, in Southern Europe, uh, but also in uh, much of uh, Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe too. And I'll mainly be talking about North America and Europe today. We can talk obviously a lot about what's happening in Chile, Argentina, uh, the Philippines, Brazil. Um, but m much of the analysis, at least in the book, is focused on Europe and North America. And I'll try and convince you as to what, what I think is going on. And I wanted to start with this book by Hillary Clinton. I don't know if you've read this book. It's called What Happened, which is um, her version of what happened in 2016 when she lost to <coughs> Donald Trump. And the reason I started here is, firstly, I read the book um, when I was trying to understand why so few people saw Donald Trump's victory uh, coming. And um, I got to the end of the book, and I realized that Hillary Clinton still doesn't know what happened. <laughs> Um, in the sense that this is a, this is a book that is absolutely obsessed with short-term factors. Uh, should I have gone to Michigan? Should I have gone to Wisconsin? Did I hire the right data analyst? Did Russia hack the election? Um, was it all because of the FBI director, James Comey? This is basically a book that doesn't look back further than 2016. And the reason that I start with this book in my talks is because I think this book is a nice symptom, a reflection of where our debate about political change is going wrong. We are utterly obsessed with what is happening in the here and now, and we have completely lost sight of the deeper, longer-term trends that are bubbling away underneath our democracies. And just to give you one example with regards to the US, you could have seen Trump coming. And, uh, a couple of people did, not many. You could have seen him coming if you'd been looking at the Democrats and how their electorate had been changing over time. That over uh, about a 10 year period before Donald Trump descended the escalator in Trump Tower, the Democrats had been losing a large amount of support among white Americans with only some college education and white Americans with only some high school education. They've been doing very well among African Americans, among Asian, Hispanic, Latino Americans, but among white voters with only some high school education or some college education, their support had basically been collapsing. And much the same thing happened, by the way, with Brexit. The reason I was telling a lot of people, I remember Peter mentions it, and this isn't to blow my own trumpet, but I remember going to Paris and Berlin and talking to people like you in the financial services sector saying Britain's going to vote for Brexit and one of the reasons why it was obvious that was going to happen was exactly the same trend that the white working class less well educated voters the key pro-Brexit group had basically dislodged themselves from the mainstream and were overwhelmingly supportive of Brexit and if you look at how we've explained that moment um, it's all been about short-term factors. It was about what was written on the side of a bus. We send the EU 350 million pounds a week. Let's spend it on our healthcare system. This was Boris Johnson's famous pledge, which people said was misleading. Then we had a big debate over Cambridge Analytica. Uh, was it about what people read on Facebook and Twitter? I've read every single academic study that's been done on social media. I'm happy to have a debate with you. Uh, Britain did not vote for Brexit because of what they were reading on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, I'll have a, happily have a debate with you. The evidence is nowhere near convincing uh, on that. Um, but this was all about short-term factors. But if you looked at the long-term trends and you looked at what Brits wanted to do with their relationship uh, with Europe, did they want to leave the EU or did they want to dramatically reduce the amount of powers that the European Union has? Then since um, 1996, with the exception of only two years, a clear majority consistently wanted to leave the EU or reduce its powers. And if you've been looking from 2012 onwards, over 60% of Britain was saying consistently, and this is the best data we have, the National Centre for Social Research, I want to leave the EU, I want to dramatically reduce its powers. Nobody wanted to believe the data points because we all engage in confirmation bias. We want to see what we want to see. We don't believe things that violate our, our, our own belief systems. But it was quite clear that Britain was lining up to vote uh, to leave the European Union. And I can tell you one story, actually, as long as it remains 
between, the, well, as long as it remains in the world of Santander, um, and this, I know we're filming this, but I'm assuming that, Peter, this won't go beyond the world of Santander. Um, so I can tell you, I, I, was, I was working, this just might be of interest to you, on the day of the referendum in 2016, I was working on an exit poll. Uh, and we, had, we were looking at, for people like you in this city and so on, what was happening, um, what was happening on the ground as people were voting. Uh, we had people outside 200 polling stations, and at the end of the day, we had leave two points ahead of Remain. So we knew that our sampling frame was accurate and we knew that the model was working. I can tell you at 10 o'clock in the morning, leave was eight points ahead. Okay, people couldn't wait to vote for Brexit. It was like, do I go to the garden center or do I go and vote for Brexit? Because it was mainly an older demographic. And by about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, that lead had come down to about four or five points. And then I thought, well, Remain is going to win because middle-class professionals like yourselves, you're busy, you're in the office. I thought you're going to come off at five o'clock, six o'clock. I don't know what the Santander hours are like. I imagine they're longer than that. <laughs> Maybe you're having a siesta at that point. I'm not sure. And then you'll, you'll come back and you'll go and vote. And most likely you'll vote to Remain. And the students who are waking up and they're turning off Netflix, they'll go and vote. And I thought Remain would win. And on the day of the referendum, I don't know if any of you were in the UK, but there was torrential rain. It was the worst storm I'd ever seen. Uh, and rain was just thundering down. Maybe that was the reason why, in the end, Leave held on to that two-point lead. We'll never know. But the fundamentals really did favour Brexit. And ever since then, I think the debate's gone a bit wrong too, because we've assumed that everybody's going to change their mind. And with populism, well, once the populists get into power, or once the uh, voters <coughs> who, who we lump together with populism, once they get what they want, they'll realise it isn't as good as what they thought, and they'll change their minds. Brexit wasn't exclusively a populist movement, and I really don't agree with people who say Brexit is the same as Trump. <coughs> Brexit is fundamentally a mainstream movement in British politics. It's rooted in Euroscepticism, which comes through the British Conservative Party. It's a very mainstream political force in Britain. But there was this view that everybody would change their minds in the aftermath, that once the UK economy slowed down, we had a study last week that showed in the 30 local council areas in the UK that... Um, have experienced the sharpest increases in unemployment since the referendum, 28 voted for Brexit. So since the referendum, the unemployment increases that have occurred, of the most dramatic increases, most of them have come in leave areas. But even still, the British public, or at least leavers, are saying to us pretty loudly, je ne regrette rien. They don't really care. If you ask people, as YouGov, a very, as you know, a, a reputable pollster has been asking people since the referendum, in hindsight, do you think Britain was right or wrong to vote to leave the European Union? The blue line is the people saying, right, we should have left. And the green line is the people saying, we were wrong to vote to leave the EU. Now, over time, <laughs> gradually, you can see how regret has been getting a little bit of a lead but it's barely outside the margin of error. I mean, you can balance a tray of drinks on those lines. And the reason is, as we know, people's values don't really change. And Brexit was a reflection of a much deeper value divide between what you loosely might call social liberals on the one side and social conservatives on the other. If the election in December doesn't go uh, the way that Boris Johnson wants it to go, if it's anything other than a Conservative majority, and the polls this morning suggest, again, it will be a Conservative majority. Boris Johnson has an eight or nine point lead. Um, if it's anything other than that, a Labour coalition, a Labour minority government, uh, the Labour Party in coalition with the Scottish Nationalists, the Labour Party in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, it is entirely plausible that we would have a second referendum. If you ask people, how would you vote at that second referendum, and you take the average of the most recent polls, then Remain is on 53% and Leave is on 47%. Of course, people would say that the polls put Remain ahead before the original referendum. That's not entirely true. Some of the online polls were showing Leave was, was ahead before the first referendum. But what is interesting is if you drill down into the data, 
It's not leavers and remainers who are changing their minds. It's people who didn't vote in 2016. It's the non-voters. So if you are a passionate remainer hoping for a second referendum, the number one strategic challenge you face is finding people who didn't vote in 2016 and making sure they vote. Uh, that's the number one strategic challenge. What is actually going to happen at the election is anybody's guess, but one thing to bear in mind is that we've never had rates of volatility in British politics like the rates of volatility that we have today. Uh, we have more people switching their votes from one election to the next than we've ever had in our post-war history. I think probably uh, you could relate to this given some of the changes that you've seen in your politics over recent years. But to give you a statistic that I think sums up Britain, between the election in 2010 and the election in 2017, 49% uh, of all voters changed their vote from one party to another. Uh, Lib uh, Liberal Democrats going Labour, now Labour going Liberal Democrats. Uh, UKIP voters going Conservative, now Conservative voters going Brexit Party, and Brexit Party going back to being Conservative. Uh, conservative Remainers going to the Labour Party, Labour Leavers going to the Conservative Party. Some Labour Party voters going to the Greens, now some Greens going back to the Labour Party and some Lib Dems going to the Scottish Nationalists, and some Scottish Nationalists going, uh, going back to Labour. All of this means, if you ask me, Matt, make a prediction for the general election in December, I would say to you, only an idiot would give you a prediction for what's going to happen. It is incredibly volatile. Uh, it really is a nightmare to call. And of course, the other thing that this loops into, Mr. Farage is up here, who said this morning, actually, that he is going to stand uh, 500 candidates at Britain's general election, uh, around 500. That's a big problem for Boris Johnson. Uh, even if Nigel Farage gets 5 or 6% of the vote, it could cost Boris Johnson the election. Um, but of course, this is part of the broader trend that we're now also witnessing in parts of southern Europe, like here in Spain, too, which is the rise of national populism. And Spain's an interesting one for me because when I was doing my PhD in the early 2000s, I was always told that there were four democracies that would always be immune to populism. And Spain was one of them um, because of the political history, the stigma that was associated with anti-establishment populism. The Netherlands was another one because it's historically liberal, historically tolerant. Sweden, again, very liberal state, strong welfare state, pretty sound economy. The UK, because famously we had the civic culture, we were deferential to authority, as reflected in our love for Downton Abbey. We were very uh, polite. We didn't do populism because we were very consensual in our politics. And also Germany, for obvious reasons. Um, but if you look at those democracies now, they have all experienced pretty profound political uh, change. And my frustration is simply that in our debate about what's causing that change, we really have remained incredibly insular, incredibly uh, short-termist in our thinking. And for those of you in the financial services, the number one thesis that I'm told every other week from the Financial Times is this is still all about the financial crisis. It's all about the European sovereign debt crisis, it's all about austerity or imports from China, essentially. It's, it's basically the Martin Wolf take, is this is basically about economic competition. And one of the things that I would like to do is challenge that a little bit. So one of the interesting macro questions for all of you, I suppose, to think about is when you look at all of this political churn and change, uh, Trump in the US, Brexit, populism, protectionism in Europe, and what's happening to our party systems, this fragmentation of European political systems, does that signal that we are leaving a period of political volatility, or does it signal that we are entering into a new era in our political development? And that's a fairly simplistic question, and it's a simplistic way of framing it, but the reason I ask that question is because it gets us into many of the popular understandings of what's going on. If you think we're leaving a period of political change, you're probably won over by The Economist, which <laughs> argues regularly that this is all about generational replacement, that this is about angry old white men who 
how can I say diplomatically, are going to slip over the horizon and be replaced by new ethnically, culturally diverse liberal groups that will fundamentally realign our politics. Um, if instead you think that what we're witnessing is the emergence of movements that are symptomatic of deeper structural shifts in our political system, then you would probably be pointing to some of the evidence uh, that I will uh, point to uh, today. The first, I mean, there's five key messages I want to leave you with. The first is that the political, um, the financial crisis that erupted after 2008 accelerated some of the changes in our political systems, but it was not a causal driver of, of volatility in politics. If you take a long-term trend of political change like I do, and you look at rates of political volatility, not market volatility, but the rate of change, people switching their votes from one party to another, from 19, basically from 1950 <coughs> to where we are today, that rate of political volatility has consistently now been trending upwards really since about 1970. So the post-war economic boom for 30 years, you know, that kind of post-war moment that you know, we all read about in the textbooks, was also accompanied by the golden age of representative democracy. Alignments between voters and parties were strong, turnout was quite high, politics was on the whole quite predictable. But you can see how even before the financial crisis, which is about here, even before that kicks in, you've got political volatility inching upwards across 19 advanced democracies. That in particular went hand in hand with the collapse of some of our traditional uh, political ideologies. That volatility really began to tear apart the electorates that used to hold together, for example, social, dem social democracy. One of the guys who first saw this in 1985 was Adam Przorsky, who argued in his excellent book, Capitalism and Social Democracy, that social democracy's electorate was unsustainable over the long term because it would have to meet the reality that it was holding traditional blue-collar workers on one side and university-educated middle-class professionals on the other. One group was fundamentally liberal in orientation. The other group was fundamentally socially conservative in orientation. And if you look, just take the British Labour Party as an example, 60% of the Labour Party seats voted for Brexit. So now the Labour Party is having to struggle with the fact that a North London seat like Hampstead voted 70% to remain in the European Union, whereas an industrial northern Labour seat like Hartlepool voted 70% for Brexit. That is an example of the broader strategic challenge that has rumbled underneath social democracy as it's collapsed across large parts of Europe. Now, there are countries, I don't need to point them out to you, that are something of the exception. But the left in Europe in general is not having a good time of it because of this underlying structural weakness in its electorate. And if you look in particular, just in terms of trying to navigate where the Brexit debate is going, that volatility that has been taking place across all of these democracies that's what it looks like in the UK. From 1966 to where we are today, we've got the two most volatile elections in post-war British history, not just about Brexit. And one of the ironies of all of this is Britain might have voted to leave the European Union, but our politics, as a result, have become much more European. Uh, you guys will recognise the fragmentation of our party system. I don't need to speak to people in Spain about political fragmentation. But you would recognise the way in which multi-party politics has now thrust our party system into almost near paralysis. Our failure to leave the EU in March has turned a once stable two-party system into a four-party mess. As the Conservatives are now having to fend off against the Brexit party, 
and as a Labour Party are having to fend off against the Liberal Democrats and the Greens. Which means Boris Johnson could easily, five weeks from now, find himself with a huge majority, but on the lowest share of the vote the Conservative Party has ever won. But it could also mean that Jeremy Corbyn, the most radical left-wing politician that we've ever had, could easily find himself Prime Minister uh, in coalition based on just a three-point uniform swing from the last election in 2017. And if you want to see some market effects, that would produce some market effects, I think, for sure. The second key message, I think, firstly, not that only that volatility was a long time coming, but that when you look at Europe, it isn't actually all doom and gloom. Like some of the fundamentals, and we talked a little bit about this this morning with Carl Bildt uh, and uh, Xavier Solana, that if you look at some of the key things that are rumbling through Europe politically, yes, it's more volatile. Yes, party systems are fragmenting. Yes, there are lots of populists. But there are some good things that are going on too. If you look at support for the Eurozone single currency, large majorities in the latest Eurobarometer say they are for the Eurozone single currency. On average, 62% support it. There are some points of concern among some more Central and East European states, but in general, since Britain voted for Brexit, support for the Euro single currency has increased. So too has support for remaining in the European Union. If there was a referendum tomorrow, how would you vote? Well, if you ask people across Europe, the average 66% say they would vote to remain in the European Union, but that, that includes a large range here, 85% in Luxembourg, down to Italy, which is 44% would vote to remain, 24% would vote to leave, and this is what would make me nervous if Italy ever gets a referendum, 32% undecided. Now, of course, because of Italy's constitution, it's not really able to have a, const uh, a referendum on EU membership. And, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. I don't think we're likely to see that kind of vote anytime soon. But the rallying effect is very real. And this has come across in lots of different types of data. One of the interesting effects of Brexit is that it's actually pushed back Euroscepticism in other countries. Marine Le Pen is no longer talking about leaving the European Union. The Sweden Democrats are now only talking about reforming the European Union, not leaving. But within that, there is a very real challenge. If you look at uh, some of the latest data on political fragmentation, uh, the picture is not so positive. Uh, Anna this morning was talking about the need for business to have political certainty and the need for business to have stable governments. Um, if you look at the overall rates of fragmentation across European democracies, the number of parties that are represented in Parliament and the number of parties that are receiving more than 10% of the vote at elections, and in countries like Norway, in Portugal, in Germany, France, Finland, in Italy, in Spain, in terms of parliamentary, um, sorry, in terms of vote share, you can see that fragmentation in Belgium, where they've struggled to form a government, uh, fragmentation is becoming quite a big issue. Um, the conclusion of one recent study was that the consequences of Europe's political fragmentation are already visible. In the coming years, the social, economic and political ram ramifications of these trends are likely to continue or increase, especially as many of the continent's largest economies are starting to slow down. Italy is in a recession. Germany recently lowered its growth predictions. In Europe, political risk and its close connection to economic risk is here to stay. And that fragmentation largely reflects the way in which those traditional ideologies are breaking up as those rates of volatility kick in, which is going to make it harder to put together ideologically coherent governments that are stable, strong, and give me, as a political analyst, some predictive power uh, in terms of what's going to happen. So fragmentation, I don't think, is going to go anywhere. Nor is national populism 
There is a bit of a debate about what's happening uh, with regard to populism and also how to define it. I would define national populism simply as a movement that wants to prioritise the uh, culture and the uh, interests of the national group against an elite who they argue are neglectful, corrupt or <laughs> self-serving. The thing that would worry me in your shoes is that national populists are also increasingly becoming economically protectionist. In the 1990s, uh, an academic called Herbert Kitschelt once argued that the winning formula for populism was two things, anti-immigration appeals combined with economic liberalism, a bit of Thatcherism basically. Now, the winning formula is anti-immigration combined with a bit more economic protectionism. So if you put Marine Le Pen in a room with Jeremy Corbyn, they'd probably get along with regards to economic policy. They'd be talking about bankers' bonuses. They'd be talking about uh, Amazon not paying tax, Starbucks not paying tax. They'd probably be talking about the need for a financial transactions levy, which Jeremy Corbyn is offering during this um, general election campaign. But national populism is now meeting the left on two flanks. It's offering voters two things, economic protectionism and cultural protectionism. And that's one of the challenges that is going to bear down on the mainstream. It's important to keep it in proportion. If you look at the European Parliament elections in the spring, 29% of all seats in the European Parliament can now be described as populist, but not just national populists, that's an assortment of left-wing populists, right-wing populists, and also movements that we can't easily classify, like Five Star in Italy. But if you look at the general trajectory since the late 1990s, when it was just 9%, we're going up to 14% uh, in 2004, 13.9, 14%, and then 29%. Nowhere near a majority, but certainly a more disruptive political force. If you look at what impact these parties are having, we now have two systematic studies in political science that make, I think, what is the key point, which is national populism is less significant because of its direct effects. It's not just about the vote share. It's more important because of its indirect effects at dragging the system over to its policy programme. Uh, we've got a nice study that came out at the end of last year which showed how since 1980 national populist parties have moved over to the right, further and further to the right, from a liberal position down here to a more authoritarian position up here. And what's interesting is that not only have centre-right parties followed them, like Sebastian Kurz in Austria, Boris Johnson in Britain, but so too have mainstream left parties across Europe. If you look, for example, at the Danish Social Democrats as an example, offering quite restrictive policies on migration. If you look at the Sweden Social Democrats now saying they think they want to do labor market uh, stress testing. So one of the key points is when we think about populism, instead of thinking about what percentage of the vote are they winning at elections, we also need to really think about the indirect policy impact that these parties are having simply by being visible, simply by being in the party system. The fourth key point, which is perhaps the more um, controversial in a, in a room full of um, economically minded um, analysts, is that I do think the debate has gone fundamentally wrong in one really important area. In my world of social science, we're having a big debate about what's at the root of public support for uh, these movements. And there are a lot of analysts that say this is all about economic scarcity and competition, which in essence was Karl Marx's argument that where you get scarce competition you get comp uh, and you get the public fighting over resources, they're more likely to turn to nationalist <coughs> solutions. On the other side, there is the view that actually economics is not relevant. It's not about imports from China. This is mainly about cultural change. This is mainly about demographic change. This is mainly about debates over the role of Islam within Western <coughs> society, or this is about the pace of immigration. I think it's fair to say that it's not either or, that it's about how they interact. And to give you one example, if we look at the Brexit vote, people who felt economically left behind 
were less likely to see Brexit as a risk, but their primary driver for voting for Brexit was a desire to lower freedom of movement and immigration and to have decisions that are taken uh, about the UK to be taken in the UK. So it was a combination of sort of sovereignty, immigration, but backed up by a sense of economic loss. And in that sense, my, one of my um, uh, descriptions that I use is we've got about 30 years of social science research, which I think suggests quite strongly that cultural drivers are primary and cultural change is sitting in the driving seat, but economic insecurity is sitting in the passenger seat, playing a very strong supportive role. And if you want an example, there's a lot of studies now looking at the Trump vote in the US, and they all pretty consistently find that one of the strongest predictors of support for Trump was actually not economic hardship. That was a stronger predictor of support for Hillary Clinton. There's a lot more evidence in our book. We sort of summarize all this evidence so you don't have to read all the studies. Um, but in particular, it was in local counties that had experienced the most rapid demographic change in a short period of time that were considerably more likely to vote for Trump. Uh, in the same way, if you look at the vote for Brexit, it was one of the biggest misleading arguments was that Brexit was supported by people who lived in all white areas who had no experience with diversity. Not true. If you run an analysis on the Brexit vote, it was significantly higher in areas that had experienced rapid demographic change in just 10 years. And so an example would be a local council going 97% white British to 84% <coughs> white British in about eight, nine years. And that rapid change then kicks in to strong support uh, for Brexit. So to give you an example, Donald Trump won 73% of counties where diversity at least doubled since 2000 and 80% of counties where there were, was an even more dramatic increase in the overall share uh, of diversity. So one of my arguments, and I'm happy to debate it with you, is that the future of politics and the way in which politics impacts on your business is actually not just simply going to be shaped by economic insecurity, it's going to be shaped by cultural insecurity. And cultural insecurity is going to relate to a very diffuse but potent debate over migration, borders, and security. And this is the cluster of issues that often we tend to remove from political debate. It's very difficult to talk about these issues. Um, people are very reluctant to get into that conversation. I mean, it's much easier to say, this is about jobs, this is about wages, this is about economic growth. I understand why we all like that argument. But to give you a couple of examples, if you look at some survey data from earlier this year and you ask voters what, what are the top two pressing priorities facing the European Union today, this isn't about jobs, this isn't about wages, this is about migration and security. If you look at the relationship that was critical to the Brexit vote, the reason that Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson were able to win that referendum is because the statistical relationship between how people think about the European Union and their concerns about migration became incredibly uh, strong, it became much stronger uh, over a short period of time. Uh, between 2002, which is the blue dot, and 2016, that relationship in Britain became a lot stronger, which allowed Vote Leave to win that referendum. This is a nice study by some colleagues in Austria who show that the same thing is beginning to happen across a large number of EU member states, in particular Italy, by the way, that the relationship between how people think about the European Union and how concerned they are about issues like migration and refugees is bringing them not too far behind to where Britain was in 2016. I'm not saying these countries are going to leave the European Union. But I am saying that the debate over cultural insecurity is going to become much more important to the future of the European Union than we even currently understand. And if you look at some of the longer term trends that are facing Europe, if you look at the way in which Europe is aging over the longer term, uh, in particular, in uh, this is just showing you the old age dependency ratio. 
Um, if you look at much of Central and Eastern Europe, several of those countries are forecast to depopulate significantly by 2050. Places like Bulgaria would be a good example. But if you look at the longer term trajectory for Europe, <coughs> with the continent forecast to age, and if you look at where population growth globally is going to come from between now and 2100, which really isn't a long time, Europe will stagnate, North, and, um, North America will stagnate, much of the world's global uh, population growth will come via Asia and come via Africa. And some of this demographic change will be incredibly important for Europe. It's going to effectively uh, be needed to boost economies and to fill uh, gaps uh, that a lot of those economies are going to have. But one of the tensions that is inevitably going to arise is that many of the states that will need that migration the most in Central and Eastern Europe are also currently the most hostile to experiencing that kind of social change. And it's going to be a challenge, I think, for Europe going forward. The answer to that is, to be honest, a much more um, mainstream and honest debate about how to reform migration and support social cohesion and integration. And hopefully, uh, that debate will materialize quite soon. My final message um, is this question of when does normality return, to go back to that macro question at the beginning. And when people ask that question, they're usually thinking about that brief window between Fukuyama writing The End of History in 1989 and 9-11. Nine, and that's basically that small window when everybody said, oh, this is now the future and liberalism is here to stay. And it is worth just reminding ourselves of the argument as to why moderate social democracy and liberalism generally seem to be in ascendance. There are two key reasons. One is liberalism satisfies everybody's struggle for recognition. You all like liberalism because it gives you individual rights, so you feel recognised. That's why you like it more than fascism and communism, among other things. But secondly, uh, liberalism married the most dynamic economic system that we've ever had, namely free market capitalism, and so was uh, unable to be seriously contested by any other ism uh, in the world. Social Democrats were very successful because they promised to use the benefits of those economic gains to redistribute and make society fairer. In some senses they did, in other senses they didn't. But that brief window is exactly that. It's brief. Because there, if there is a consensus now, I think it's fair to say that liberalism is not by any means uh, dead, and we shouldn't yet be talking about post-liberalism. But liberalism is struggling to do the two things that Fukuyama argued that it would do. For working class and low skilled service sector workers, they no longer feel recognised by our social, political and economic system. And we talked a bit about that today. Um, large numbers of those groups in particular are voting for populist parties because they don't feel recognised within our political systems. And to be blunt, they've got a point. Uh, if you look at the evolution of our legislatures over the last 20 years. They've become increasingly highly educated. They've become increasingly affluent. There have never been more millionaires in the US Congress. There have never been more PhD holders in German politics, in French politics. Our political class has, as a consequence, become much more socially liberal, way more liberal than the population at large. And that mass citizen debate that we had earlier on with uh, uh, Richard Edelman, I think, was exactly right. Um, and so books like Diploma Democracy uh, or White Collar Government have shown convincingly that workers and less well-educated voters now have very good reason to feel that the system no longer gives them that recognition because they're not in the corridors of power. But secondly, liberalism is also now struggling via capitalism to deliver the redistributive effects that, again, Fukuyama argued would be uh, important to sustaining the status quo over the long term. And if you, I don't need to tell you the data, but if you are uh, a working class um, factory, you know, if you're a factory worker, manual production worker, 
since the 1970s, your share of national income across most advanced uh, economies um, has consistently almost declined over the long term. Uh, and so when those voters are saying, I'm just not getting a fair piece of the pie, um, they have a point that's gone alongside the decline of union membership and alongside the things that allowed those uh, voters to feel as though actually they were part of this uh, economic discussion. If you think everything I've said until this point is wrong, and you disagree with everything I said, which that's absolutely fine, my students do on a regular basis, um, the one thing that no <coughs> serious analyst can disagree with is, even if none of that is true, the last big message here is we are now all in the era of dealignment that we are now in an era when our voters feel much less tribally loyal to the established political parties. And if you look from the 1950s to where we are today, if you look in the US, where there's a record share of independence, if you look at Britain, if you look at Germany, if you look at France, this is Sweden, uh, which I think is quite interesting because Sweden used to be very stable in terms of its politics, now only 17% uh, of people would say they feel strongly attached to the main parties. This is going to give us more volatility whether we like it or not, irrespective of the other issues that we've discussed because you've got less people anchored in the party system. So this party uh, de-alignment is really going to matter uh, going forward. If you put it all together, you've got those five big trends, those five big currents then I think the question isn't how do you get rid of populism, we're never going to be able to get rid of populism, the best we can do is learn to live with national populism and perhaps think a little bit more interestingly about how we might uh, address the grievances behind uh, populist movements, perhaps be a little bit less obsessed with the populists themselves, might be good to actually think about dealing with the drivers of these movements uh, rather than obsessing with their tweets and with their speeches. Um, but overall, I think it's almost impossible to avoid the conclusion that we are entering a period of profound change, that we're not leaving uh, a period of profound change. Um, but Peter, I'll leave it there and we can go into some discussions, <coughs> some questions and some thoughts. So thank you very much. Questions? We have a microphone. <coughs> mm, we should have a microphone, but uh, um, uh, is there anyone who has a question that they'd like to ask? And I'll make sure it gets heard. Why don't we start here with the... Yes, push the button and... I can hear as well. I can repeat the question. Okay. Thank you. This one, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, what are the recommendations now you're giving us? Sure. Should I take a few, Peter, or just... Does anyone well, else want to throw a question? Just, yeah, over here. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, another factor we talked about, you talked about the, the uh, economic conditions and reasons, uh, the migrations. What about the religious factor, which in some countries is of quite of importance? Mm. Yeah. And just lastly up here, yeah. How would you define populism? Yeah. Well, national pop... Firstly, one of the tricky things is we're now dealing with economic populists and national populists. Um, and they're two very different movements. Jeremy Corbyn, if you saw his speech three days ago, just from a financial perspective, from your world, I really strongly recommend you look at it on YouTube and just see the way in which they're approaching financial services. It was the most populist speech I've ever seen by a Labour leader in my lifetime, almost by any politician, certainly almost more populist than Nigel Farage, if that's possible. Jeremy Corbyn was mentioning specifically by name, hedge fund managers, um, bank managers, uh, media owners, and saying he's effectively going after them. 
The first serious populist movement in history, most people consider to be the US People's Party in the 1890s. And they used to take Abraham Lincoln's uh, saying and adapt it and say that they were against a government that was for Wall Street, uh, representing Wall Street, and just only interested in Wall Street. And Jeremy Corbyn, in a way, is a kind of return to that pure, unadulterated economic populism. And one of the things financial services is potentially going to have to deal with is a very visible Corbynomics campaign in the UK and a very visible Warrenomics campaign in the US where Wall Street is voicing similar concerns. So economic populists prioritize class. National populists prioritize nation. National populism to me would be defined as a movement that prioritizes the interests and the culture of a majority group against what it argues are neglectful, corrupt, self-serving elites. There is no ambiguity. The world is black, it's white, it's binary. It's good, it's evil, it's yes, it's no. And so the marketplace of ideas, the kind of true essence of representative democracy, where we all come into this room and we bargain and we compromise until we reach a consensus, is shut down. And then life becomes a referendum. We take a vote and it's majority against minorities, even if it's on a sensitive issue like migration. And so that is also actually, take, takes us into a slightly broader debate at the moment, which is, are people giving up on democracy? And the short answer to that is no. Large numbers of people in existing democracies still voice support for democratic governance. But what we are witnessing for the rest of our lives is a battle over what conception of democracy is going to dominate. And it's that liberal individual rights conception versus what the populists are offering, which is a direct Athenian conception of democracy. Majority will against minorities, even if it's on sensitive issues like migration, refugee rights, and so on. And that battle, I think, is going to rage for a long time to come because it taps into these deeper things, which gets me to the question about response, about people feeling shut out from the political, economic, and social system. So how could you reply to populism? One thing is to think very seriously about political reform. If I give you one stat about Britain, you know, the reason that 65% of working class people in Britain voted for Brexit, 74% of people with no qualifications at all who left school at 16 voted for Brexit, 74%. Okay, but the reason those two groups were so key, I would argue, is because they do have good reason to feel they're not represented in the corridors of power. The share of politicians in Westminster who have any experience of working class occupations is 4%. The percentage who have only ever worked in politics is 18%, 1.8%. Okay, we do have a problem, a representational deficit for some groups. Now there are more women in uh, legislatures than ever before. That's a great achievement for liberal society. And there are more ethnic minorities in uh, legislatures than ever before. That is a great achievement by liberal society. But at the same time, we've never had fewer working class men or women, non-graduates, men or women, in the corridors of power. So we need to think about political reform. I, I think we really need to think about that. Alongside the debates we're having about the economy, I think, for example, if you look at Switzerland or Austria or the Netherlands, that, that had very vibrant populist movements even before the financial crisis, that had low rates of unemployment, pretty sound economies, that I think is a nice reminder that even if we get the economic stuff right, there are still going to be these grievances relating to culture and representation that we'll need to think much more seriously about than we do. And I would strongly recommend some of the, um, the book that I mentioned, Diploma Democracy, which is very good at uh, documenting the way in which our representation, political representation, has changed over the last two centuries. And in the US, White Collar Government by Nicholas Carnes is another uh, really good book. Um, but the question over here, sorry, was... Um, about religion. Yeah, about religion. Well, one of the arguments, certainly, that I find fairly persuasive is one of the indirect uh, currents that's helping populist movements is the decline of religion and the growing secularization 
of many of our Western societies because it's leading people further and further away from universal principles and aspirations and leaving them more open to nationalist, nation-orientated campaigns. Uh, that can have two twin effects. I mean, if you think about the role of religion, also in capitalism, in the early days of capitalism, religion played quite an important legitimizing role, sort of legitimized capitalism in the economic system. Now that's much less the case, as our societies become much more atom um, individualistic, it's become much more self-interested, and the social bonds that cut across groups and tie people together have become much weaker over time. I mean, Robert Putnam's made this argument in the US, bowling alone. We've had similar arguments uh, uh, here in Europe that as our societies have become more individualistic, groups have felt a greater affinity to movements that are offering them some form of communal identity, a tribal identity that can help them navigate through that storm. So I think it is important. I don't think it's the whole story, but I think it is important. Do we have time for a quick round, Peter? Absolutely. Are there? Please go ahead. And, does, yeah. Yeah. Just there's a question questions. here. And then, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. And my question is actually related also to the, the previous one on religion, and it's actually about if you consider that the rise of um, um, Islamist movements in the north of Africa following the Arab Spring is also considered a revolt against liberal democracy, because if we think about it, it's the revolt of the unemployed youth, which actually are against a liberal democracy system that uh, uh, was there since the, l the last 20, 30 years. But I wanted to know if you think the same or what's your opinion on this topic. Thank you. There's a question up here, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, here, sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the, for the lecture. Uh, one question, do you think that this national populism could bring us to something more violent, such as a war or something like that, in the future? Because everything is, is little by little is getting more polarized, and at some point there would be no, no, um, how do you call it, no point of, of, uh, of agreement between the, the parts that are polarized? Mm. Um, my question is really about um, what role we can play. And, and so we're very fortunate we have branches all around the countries that we're in. I've traveled to about 180 of our branches in the UK and seen quite a big difference. And, I, and it makes me reflect on what is the role that business can play to support bringing more cohesion. Yeah, good qu yeah thanks. Great questions. Um, one of the interesting, to speak to your point about levels of support for liberal democracy or tensions within communities and, and democracy. Um, one of the interesting findings that came out about three weeks ago was a study that showed national populists now have considerable support from LGBT communities. And about 20% of Marine Le Pen's electorate in France comes from LGBT communities. Um, there's a nice uh, summary of that study on the LSE blog, if you're interested. And the authors um, explain that by pointing to uh, an anxiety among those voters over a sense that the gains that liberal democracy has made are under threat as their groups become increasingly secular, but Europe over the long term becomes increasingly religious. Um, and they're worried that some of those rights are now under threat from ongoing uh, rapid uh, demographic change and cultural change. And this is a really sensitive debate to have, but it's clear in the empirical data that this is happening, that you now do have um, changes in the support base for these parties that we didn't used to see. Another example would be young women. Um, in, a, in a number of democracies, young women are becoming much more supportive of national populists than they were in the 80s and 90s. In the 80s and 90s, we used to talk about these movements as being male movements because the gender gap was so pronounced, but now, Nobody can really explain why you have stronger support among younger women for these, for these movements. And whether that, too, is, is linked to a perception that the gains that have been made with regards to women's rights are somehow being challenged by the rapid social changes underway, I don't know. I think we need a lot more research on that uh, and, and also a lot more research on how migration flows 
in the future are going to impact upon Europe and how we can bolster integration and cohesion around it. And I think the point about the role of business is really interesting. I had a question from a pension fund about two weeks ago, and they were saying, well, should they be engaged in politics to make the case against some of the arguments that Jeremy Corbyn has been making in, in Britain about the role of business and private sector involvement in the rail networks or the privatisation of gas and water, and should they be campaigning in this debate against some of these arguments um, and campaign promises? And they're obviously very nervous to be doing that because they too don't want to become politicised. And one of the things that I think was hanging over the discussion this morning, um, particularly with Richard Edelman's presentation, and I was, I was wondering, is when we talk about corporations <laughs> and businesses defending and promoting values, the question is what values? And the challenge that we face is that in the polarised societies, we have now got fundamental value divides that we, are, we know are very entrenched and are not going to go anywhere anytime soon between more liberal-minded citizens and more socially conservative citizens. So if you are, for example, a corporation, am I allowed to mention HSBC? Is that, yeah. So if you are a corporation like HSBC that's doing a very aggressive um, liberal campaign in London at the moment saying that you know, HSBC is a sort of, you know, the bank for sort of citizens of ev everywhere and you know, it's trying to tap into this debate about global citizenship, you can understand the logic behind that, but you can also quickly understand how that could generate quite a sharp backlash in our polarised environment. I mean, we now have, I'm seeing data in Britain, for example, that is really worrying. So if you ask Remainers and Leavers, would you be happy if your son or daughter brought home somebody from the other Brexit tribe? Okay, about 34% of Remainers say they would be unhappy if their child brought home a Lever and said they were going on a date with a Lever. Uh, and interestingly, I'll leave this with the pro-EU Remain folks in the room. Interestingly, 34% for Remainers, it's 11% for Leavers. It's quite a big difference. This is a YouGov study that was undertaken, which is similar. I think, Peter, you might be familiar with the US F uh, research and the same, the same uh, polarisation about 15 years ago. It seems that the UK is following that US model, um, becoming more polarised. And so for business... If you're going to speak out, the question is, what side are you going to speak out for? How are you going to frame it? How are you going to convey legitimacy? Who are you democratically accountable to? Um, are you going to be seen as a, an advocate for one side of that value divide? And if you are, are you happy to experience losses from the other side, which is often bigger than people um, anticipate? Um, so these are all very complex questions. I don't have the answers for the, um, on that. I just this is the value divide that we're, we're, now, we're now living in. And the question, sorry, over here was... Um, if, it, if it could turn in something violent in yes. the future. No, I, I, I think there are lots of good things that are happening. Uh, one thing, and national populists, with the exception of some countries, say Hungary is a particular point of concern, for example, um, in, particularly within Europe, a lot of national populists have adapted to the democratic framework, even if they're advocating a direct conception of democracy. And we have very few genuinely revolutionary movements that are also successful. So if you think about Golden Dawn in Greece, as one example, if you think about some movements in Southern Europe, I'm sure you can think of, yes, they are significant, they need to be monitored very closely, but the more revolutionary anti-democratic you are, the less successful generally you are in comparison to your more moderate populist um, counterparts. And I think that goes to show that democracy has won quite a few battles over the years, but it hasn't won all of them, uh, which is why some of these debates are still ongoing. I mean, if you look at rates of, uh, um, if you look, for example, at some of the broader trends that we've got, levels of racial prejudice generally, are in decline across much of Europe and North America. Levels of support for same-sex marriage are increasing across much of Europe and North America. And we need to celebrate, I think, some of those things, remember our achievements, as well as uh, some of the challenges. But that might be a time to call it, no, call it a day. Exactly. Thank you very much on that almost upbeat note. Great. I think we'll, we'll wrap the session up. Thank you very much uh, for coming, everybody. 
Thank you, Professor Goodwin. Great. Well, thank for you for having me. Enlightening. Thank you.